Welcome to the Win Make Give podcast. Chad Himes here, Bob Stewart there. Bob, how you doing today? I'm good, Chad. I'm good. You, you know, we we joke around here about like background envy. Yep. And we don't do video, but we get to see our guests' background. I've got background envy. Um, I'm also glad we don't do video. Like this is one of the most handsome guests we've ever had. Like, well, thank you. Oh, uh, you no, you. no, we all know. Everybody's seen you, Chad. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm just I'm excited to dive in and, and talk to to Jeremy today. All right, well that that's interesting that you have background envy. I know he has a nice looking little studio there, but that's honestly as boring a background as we've seen in most places. He's I, just gone for convenience. Uh, I, don't I don't know. I wouldn't call that boring. I think it's like it's simplistically elegant or something. I don't. Okay. Know. I like it. I like it, it. To me, it looks it's simple, right? But it's it. I don't know. I got envy. <laughs> For those of you at home who don't get to see this, we'll have Jeremy talk about it. It is, um, it's, it looks to me like some leftover wood he found, and he built this really nice looking wall behind himself of just different pieces of wood. I mean, there's a lot of layers of envy in here, Chad. I'm envious of his uh, craftsman skills. I'm envious that he could swing a hammer. Like, there's a lot of reasons for it. He's got it, a logo it. that changes colors on the wall behind him. And, that, and it, it, it kind of looks like of. my alma mater. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we've talked enough about him. Why don't we just get him in here? Uh, Jeremy Ryan Slate, welcome to the Win Make Give podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. And, and funny enough, you forgot to mention that I, I look – stupidly young as well. I'm almost 40, believe it or not. And I went to, uh, I took my dad to a Yankee game, um, in, uh, August and, uh, we had the seats where like, they give you food and stuff, which is great. So I went to go get myself a beer. And, uh, the guy says to me, um, where's your father? I'm like, he's sitting down. They're like, well, is he going to let you have this? I'm like, I hope so. I've been 21 for a long time now. <laughs> you do have a youthful glow about you, Jeremy. <laughs> you do. Jeremy, I, I once had that problem, and that's why I grew the goatee, so it made me look a little older. So, you know, maybe you need one of those handlebar mustaches, something. I've been trying, man, but my wife tells me I look like I should be in prison when I have it. So, you know, <laughs> okay. it's that bad. We're learning I've, a lot I've, of things about Jeremy. I today. recently had my wife go, you know what? You should do something different on your face. I think she meant like she's tired of looking at me, you guys, but uh, that's why I got the gray here. Chad, it's, by the way, it's not the goatee that makes you look older. It's the gray goatee. Bro. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it wasn't gray when I first grew it to look older, Bob. It has uh, got it. grayed Roger on that. me that's working with it. Mine comes in really, really thin. So, like, I, I just, yeah. I, you then can you, look like a, you look like a child trying to grow that's a That's exactly what I was trying to go for there. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, now that we've had so much fun, it's been great speaking to you guys. We'll have a great episode. All right. No. Jeremy, our audience has no idea who you are. I mean, maybe some of them do, yet most of them don't. Do us a favor. We don't read bios, even though ChatGPT sent me a lovely one about you. Uh, tell everyone who you are. Uh, so my name is Jeremy Slee. I am the uh, CEO and co-founder of a company called Command Your Brand. And since uh, 2015, we've been helping our clients to build their brands by being on the right podcasts. I've also had a show uh, called The Create Your Own Life Show since 2014. We are... 1400 episodes deep or something like that at some point we we changed our numbering a while ago so i kind of don't know what number i'm on anymore at this point and uh you know i make a lot of trouble on the internet man talking you know politics religion life all sorts of fun things and um live out here in new jersey with um what my exit? wife my uh, two kids and uh, three dozen chickens okay did you just say what exit chad i did that's what you, you said if you're from in jersey, jersey that's what you ask what exit are you on yes but that would that would make sense if you didn't live where I live. I, I, I when people say what exit, I say, ha, I'm, a, I'm I'm 50 miles from the closest exit. It's the last exit. It's the last exit. I yeah. am way up on the top and to the to the left of the state, man. That, Jeremy, that's why we, I didn't we, ask it again when he said chickens. I figured we <laughs> we, we owe you uh, some thanks, and I think that's we just figured this out. Like your your company, Command Your Brand, has sent us a number of the interviews that we've done over the years as they've gone out and helped whoever that was that we had on the show develop their brand. Um, so we now get to talk to the guy that's been sending us these people, but um, you, you've been sending us some, some folks to interview along the way. Good to hear, man. Um, you know, I, I, I'm glad to hear it's not the opposite. Like, how dare you send us those people? Um, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to hear you. We sent you the cool people, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this Create Your Own Life podcast. I'm I'm fascinated over there because, of course, we're all creating our own life. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. What is the, the driving force? What got you started on that? Why that message? What's coming out of that? Talk to us a little bit about this Create Your Own Life for our audience. 
Well, the life is or the 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 message between it has changed dramatically over the years because as I mentioned, I started in 2014. And at that point in time, I, you know, I had my master's degree in, in ancient history and um, I had been a high school teacher for a couple of years and I had tried like a bunch of different entrepreneurial things that didn't work out. And I started a podcast literally as a hobby. So I started the Create Your Own Life show literally because I wanted to learn from people that are already successful. And what I found is the more I did that, I started doing things that made me more successful, building a company, you know, hiring, you know, we, we started with uh, the two of us and now we have a team of 17 and it's taken, it taken a little bit to get to that. But I've, I've also myself changed a lot around along the way. Now, the thing that's been interesting is we've had a vast shift in the past three years because I think culturally um, things aren't going so hot around the, the country and around the world. So I've tried to talk about things that to myself, I feel like matter, like things that, you know, are impacting us day to day that matter to our daily lives and, and really, you know, help you to create a life on your own terms. Because I look at it as life is a game and it, you have to know what the game board looks like if you want to play it well. And that's really what I'm helping people to do. And it's, it's interesting because that ethos has changed so much since we started the show, gosh, like eight or nine years ago now. I'm can I, can really I? curious. I got to ask this one, Bob, before you jump in there. Uh, I know you usually kind of get first question. Uh, yeah, you said life is a game. So I'm just curious if you had to pick a game that's out there, is it more like checkers? Is it like Candyland, where it's weaving all over the place? I mean, what kind of game board are we all playing on here? Oh, sometimes I feel like it's Battleship. Sometimes I feel like it's Yahtzee, man. Like, um, but ho hopefully it's a little bit more like Candyland and we're just trying to find the right surprises along the way. <laughs> Right. Love that. Bob, what you got? Love that. I just played a game of Candyland like a week ago. I've got a six-year-old. So um I, I have a four-year-old. So yes, we've been playing Candyland a yep. lot. Yep. We I'm trying to get him to we've been doing some chess lately as well, which is um fun. So I, I got a bunch of what the the this this whole idea of like life as a game, I think is is I, I don't disagree, by the way. Um what what is your feeling on like the education system in our in our like because like oh, wow, kids Bob, come up, like I know I'm just going game. right in but like you're kids going heavy come and up, hard right out of the gate man they're, they're trained like I, just they're trained a certain way right like our kids yeah. go to a public school even if they go to a private school it's not much different they're still kind of it's it's all about memorization it's all mm -hmm. about um, you know repetition it's all like there's not a lot of you know learn how to think outside the box thinking, questioning authority, like, right? Like, yeah. and, and look, I'm by no means an expert on education, right? Like I don't have sure. a PhD. Um, but I, my understanding of our current education system, it was brought up kind of in the, in the twenties and thirties, the Henry Fords of the world got together and said, we've got to create this education system that pumps out kind of a, a worker. Somebody that can go into the factory, they can memorize the instructions, they can follow the directions. Um, like just what, at, when you think about life as a game, like you, you have a four year old, like, are you, how does that play into how you kind of raise your kids in an environment where life is a game, but they're really being educated, at least formally, to kind of fit into a box or a role? Oh, Bob, there's so many directions we could go with this, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> so she's actually just about five, but we, we started homeschool this year. And I've had people say to me, oh, man, you know, homeschool kids, they're not going to get socialized. And I'm like, exactly. That's what I'm hoping for not happening because that, that, that's, that's why I want my kids to not, you know, go to public school. But I would, I would ask you this question, Bob, when you look at schools, do they reward on memorization or, or application? Memorization. Generally, what right? wins in life, memorization or application? <laughs> application. Always. There you go. And that's why, that's why the modern school system isn't set up correctly. We have to look at why it's set up the way it's set up. So our school system comes out of the Austro-Hungarian model. So this was in Hungary before the First World War um, when they wanted to make soldiers, people that could follow commands and do certain things. So then that system comes here and gets married with the Industrial Revolution, which you mentioned, you know, the Henry Ford model. So what our system is built for is people that can work in factories and take orders. That's it. And if you look at it, the single biggest thing missing is application, right? Like, you know, memorize all these things, learn these different things, how do you use it? And I think that is the single biggest thing missing. Now, if you look at the way things functioned over 100 years ago, and pretty much for thousands of years before that, there was a lot of uh, apprenticeships. And you see that a lot in the trades now, but you don't see that anywhere else. Yeah. But apprenticeships were a really big deal. If you look at uh, Benjamin Franklin, one of his first jobs, 
he was an apprentice printer and he became a printer later on when he printed poor Richard's Almanac. So apprenticeships were really big because you would get life experience, you would get application, you would do these different things. And that is the single biggest thing missing. But our education system is just built towards get one degree, get the next degree, build up, build up, build up. And all of a sudden you have all these degrees and you're like a thermometer, but you can't actually do anything. And I think that is the single biggest issue, my issue with the school system. We need some sort of application. That's what's missing. That's right. um, It's fascinating because Chad mentioned to you before we went on that you know, we have an entrepreneurial audience, but it slants towards real estate. And honestly, like, if there's one place that should have apprenticeship, it should be the idea of like, I'm going to come in and become a real estate agent. I'm going to yes. try to get you, Jeremy, to, to let me handle the largest financial transaction of your life, most likely, right, for most people. And I could have done it three times before I got to you, right? Like, mm -hmm. I just think that apprenticeship model I don't know. Like, we're, well, I think they're bringing it back. I think they're just calling it internships nowadays. Well, they, 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 they are and they aren't too because internships are hard and competitive to get a lot of times. And many times you're just kind of a glorified coffee getter depending on what kind of business you get at. Like I'm talking about like a job where you actually get paid to do it and you work in that for a period of time. So like uh, here's an example. As a teenager, the best job I ever had is I worked for a house painter. And we worked long, hard days, man. We started at 6 a.m. We finished every day at 6 p.m. They were 12-hour days. And... um I learned so much about hard work, the value of it. And the cool thing about painting is you get the satisfaction of a job well done immediately because you can see it. So when you look at that, that application is going to teach you so much in life because you're going to learn, well, how much actual hard work goes into this job? How much product was created to create this job? And you get value for work, right? And I think that's one of the, it, that application is vital. Well, this is perfect now. I can explain to my mother why I was such a failure in school. Uh, yet I've been able to have some success apparently because I just didn't memorize everything. Okay, so here's the thing. I heard you say, if I'm not mistaken, and, and Bob and I have lost count of how many episodes we've done as well. You said 1,400 episodes now you've done approximately. All right. Something like that. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going back to episode one, right? Uh, and you probably <laughs> I, I, don't I would hope you don't go back to episode one, man. It's bad. You'll cry. <laughs> so, and we say the same thing. Nobody should ever go back and listen to like episode one from Win, Make, Give. Um, and now they're all going to just to laugh at us. Uh, give me some of the highlights along the way. Who are some of the people you've talked to and what are the lessons you've taken away from them? What are some of the things you said you built your business because of things you learned? At, let's go through some of the highlights over the career of these 1400 episodes and, and we'll start playing catch up and listening as of now. Well, I'm a sports nut. So I've also interviewed a lot of pro athletes. Like I've had, uh, I've had Nick Swisher on the show. Um, I've had, um, Johnny Damon on the show. I've had a lot of people like that. I've had former CIA director, David Petraeus. Um, I've had, um, you know, foreign affairs specialists like Douglas McGregor on the show. And, you know, when you look at it, I, to me, I've learned a lot of people like that. It's life experience is their best teacher. And I think that's the biggest thing you could take to real estate. You could take to business and things like that is actually doing something is going to be a hundred percent more valuable than the theory of it. And also as well. Um, I wrote about this in my book and it's what the first chapter is about. I really wish I got to interview Tom Brady because I think he is like one of the greatest athletes ever to play. But if you look at him, you know, he's just, he's just big. That's about it. He's got a bad arm. You know, he can't really throw the, throw the ball far. He runs like he's got a piano on his back, but he's somebody that adversity has really shaped him. And that's something I've seen with a lot of my guests is adversity. They look at it as this transformative process and how can they become something different and better on the other side of it rather than that thing looks scary. I'm going to go sit on the couch and drink beer. You know, it's when somebody approaches adversity for what can I grow and what can I get out of it? That is a transformative thing. And interestingly enough, I think that is the number one thing I've learned from all my guests is how do you take adversity and how do you use it? You know, I had, um, the, the, my pillow guy on my show like four years ago, Mike Lindell, and he was talking about his life was so bad at one point he was doing, um, what the heck did they call this carpet something, but he was basically on the floor looking for crack rocks in the carpet. That's how bad his life was. And, you know, for him, it was spirituality that turned him around and helped him build a business and give, you know, tens of thousands of people a job. But it's how do you approach adversity and what are you going to do with it, man? Are, is there, can you, like, again, I, Chad and I joke, we, like, a lot of these podcasts are selfish in nature for us because I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I'm in the same my, boat. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> You're you like, admit oh. it, that's why you started the podcast was yes. to, to learn. Yeah, you want to talk to people that you want to learn something from. So, like, what do you think is, how do I teach that? 
I got a five, I got a six and a seven year old. I have a sixteen year old. How do you teach them that? You know, we just had we just had an event last week. We had Sarah Blakely there, and she went and you know Bob, she was it wasn't last week. It was and, a few months ago. Now, oh, yeah, now, now it was whatever. Too. Anyway, and then she talked about this this idea of like everyone every you know adverse situation she came into. She was trying to find the silver lining, trying to get on the other side of it. Like, how do you teach kids to be, I guess, resilient in mm. the face of adversity? Well, how I do you think teach humans. Couple- Forget kids. Like, we got yeah. adults that don't know how to do this. So. Well, I think kids is, kids are great because I'm a kind of in the process of doing that. And I'm by no means an expert. I'm just doing the best job I can do as a dad here. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the big things is, number one, talking to your kids like an adult. Like, obviously, using words they can understand, but, like, not talking them in a way that, that devalues who they are. So when, when we're going to do something, we let our kids know exactly what matters about it and, and what their part is in it. Um, as well, kids want to help. And a lot of times, parents, what they'll do is, no, you can't do that. I can do that for you. Well, even if they're doing it and not doing it well, let them try to help you. Like, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I, yesterday, I was putting new gravel at the end of my driveway. So I was loading up the pickup and uh, I'm shoveling dirt into the back or shoveling gravel into the back. And my two-year-old, two-year-old almost three-year-old comes over and says, daddy, I want to help. Okay, great. She picks up a trowel and she's trying to throw rocks in the back and they're not even making it in the back. But you know what? She feels like she's helping. And I think that's the biggest thing. So we've also worked on like responsibility with our kids because it gives them the value of life and the value of work. So as I mentioned, we have 30 chickens. So they're out there every day, picking up the eggs, counting the eggs, feeding the chickens, you know, making sure the pig has everything he needs. So we try to find these things where they feel like they are contributing. And because I think the biggest problem is, and I don't know, I don't think this happened in earlier generations. I think it's kind of my generation. I was born in the eighties and a little bit before that, that have started this. People just give, 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 give to their kids. And then they expect their kids to be able to give back when they get to be in their 20s. You know, if you just give to someone, you're making them a criminal. You have to make people exchange, right? We all exchange, whether it's a little bit or whether it's a lot. And if you allow them to do that, they're in exchange with society and they can contribute to society. So I think it might sound crazy, but that's a simple way that it works. My parents did that with me. My wife's parents did that with her. um, And I'm trying to do the same thing with my own kids. I love the idea that like, I love the idea that we should let kids fumble around, mess things up. I mean, that's adversity, right? Like, you, yeah. you, you know, the, your daughter trying to get the stuff in there, she's missing it. And we're not sitting there going, what are you doing? You're messing this whole thing up. But she knows yeah. she's not getting it in there. There's a little she's bit trying. of adversity in that, right? She's trying and she's she's maybe even failing, but that's okay, right? Yeah. That's okay. Like, that's how we, we fail and we get up, we try again. And, and maybe, you know, next time dad's got a thing of gravel, she gets a little bit closer and throws it a little bit further. And um, it's that, progression of of not always having i don't know what do they call them bulldozer parents that are just out there clearing every obstacle and every path for their children and it's it's interesting too because like i i was a really good center fielder in 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 high school and and kind of before that um but i will tell you i was a great shortstop before that and you know what happened was um the coach's kid was also a shortstop and he was terrible but he was the coach's (laughs) kid so he played so, you know, I wanted to play and he said, okay, so you're, you're, you're a really good hitter. You're a good fielder. We're going to put you in the outfield. Dude, I couldn't catch a fly ball for my life. The first ball that came to me in right field hit me in the nuts and I fell <laughs> over crying. Um, so I spent some time with my dad, who was an incredible outfielder and actually played pro ball. And, um, you know, we went out every single night and he hit fly balls to me for three hours. And, and I became the best center the fielder and... in that league, man. But and, you took and, a few off the face? You... Yeah. You dropped a whole bunch out there with dad, right? It was the adversity. I would catch of- up to, yeah, I would catch up to balls in center field that people would be like, how the hell did he do that? But you know what? My first one hit me in the nuts, man. So it, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, so I don't know. The answer, I don't know. There's an, like, what's the perfect answer? But the answer seems to be put them in situations where they're going to experience adversity and don't just jump in to rescue them in those situations. Yeah, let them work it out, man. And don't tell them they can't do it, you know? All right. Oh, well. What, what other lessons have you learned? So resilience, adversity yeah. is obviously going to be a very powerful one that you'll share with your kids and, and just shared with all of our people. Give me another lesson that's come from somebody or multiple people uh, over the course of this podcast. Well, one of the things um, I mentioned, uh, former CIA director David Petraeus, and one of the big things I learned about from him, and this wasn't when he was in the CIA, but before that, when he was uh, uh, on his, on his, working his way up to being a four-star general, um, he worked under another um, three-star at one point when he was in, in in officer school. And he said that in the military, a lot of times you get these guys that they don't have a chest big enough to pin all the medals they have on it, right? They're, they're, they're very 
very important. And he said the thing that he found is the guy that he worked for, I, I can't remember his name now, but it was General Jack something was the guy's name for the, his staff he was on. And he said this guy, you know, he'd go get his own coffee. He'd go get his own cigarette. He would, you know, hang out with the guys. He'd work alongside the guys. And leadership really is being willing to be in the trenches with somebody, work just as hard as them and not expect something from them you wouldn't do yourself. I love that. And because I think if you look at it, that's why a lot of groups don't do well. Sure, you don't have to do everything, but you have to be willing to do it and willing to show other people you can do it. I, I had Grant Cardone on the show, um, like I think six or seven years ago now. And you know he's, he had times in his office early on where his sales team couldn't make sale. So what did he do? He'd pick up the phone sitting right next to him and he'd go, watch this guy, I'm gonna close this guy. And he'd do it right in front of him. And that's what you have to do is you have to be willing to do something alongside someone, show them what's possible, but also show them like, you're not too good to do the work you're asking them to do. Yeah, big yeah, shout please. out to you, Bob Stewart, at that event that happened last week, as you <laughs> want to say. I'll put quotes around that. Uh, there was a photo I saw go around of Bob Stewart moving a garbage can because he wasn't too big to just step in and some, be janitor. Some lady to spilled her coffee and she was going to like, I'm like, what are you doing? You're going to take the, the wet rags and you're going to walk them all the way across and just drip your coffee everywhere. So it was just as much the OCD in me as it was the, the janitor to CEO mentality that we do. But um, we have Jeremy around here, uh, our, our partner, Ben, he's always talking about everybody around here is the janitor and the CEO. Like, and all respect to janitors, right? Ben's mom was a janitor and that's how she um, raised their family. Like, we, we get in, roll your sleeves up, get dirty right next to them. That idea of like Grant jumping on the phones, I've we do that all the time, right? Yeah. Like we will get in there and, and make a sales call, even though it's been a while since I've made them. Um, you know, Ben will get in there and and call a, a website visitor to try to try to set the appointment. Like we're nobody around here is beyond doing all the work, right? A lot of times, what you get is I used to do that, and that's below my pay grade, and I could still do it, but I'm not gonna. Mm -hmm. No. Well, and that that's a really interesting point too, because I have a lot of like friends and people I know that like maybe things aren't going so well in their business and they won't step in and fix some of those things or work in some of those areas because they're, they're too good to do it. And it's yeah. like, you're going to let the ship sink and rather, rather than do something about it. Like, you know, right now we're, we're, we're building a new line of business that we're doing podcast production. And I, you know, want it to be like the premier service that we're, that we're offering as long as we're already doing. So what am I doing? I spent the last two weeks writing a 17 page process document with screen recordings and how to do it. Because when I have my team do it, I know I can put my stamp of approval on it. I know I can feel its quality. So sometimes you have to be willing to step down to a lower level, humble, humble yourself and, uh, and do certain things, man. All right. So everybody listening tomorrow, go down one level for that day. Don't be too good for anything. Go make those calls beside the people. Go do whatever that is. Go make that 17 page document with video clips in there on how to do something so that you know people are doing it the right way and you're showing them that you too can still do it. So yes. you're a media expert. I mean, is what what you would be. I mean, podcasts specifically, yet there's a lot of them out there, right? Sure. I mean, does everybody need to go have a podcast? What should what should people be doing to help become that? that expert, what should Bob and I be doing? What should our audience be doing to take it to that next level for themselves? Well, I would say not everybody should have a podcast. And this Agreed. is why I, I think that you need to have a real willingness to learn and a real willingness to, to get some expertise in something or have some great expertise in something. I've witnessed a lot of people that just want to want to grandstand. And when you do that, it doesn't really have any value to other people. So if you're somebody that wants to create value for others, you're willing to teach, you're willing to connect with other people, like it is a great place for you to be. Now, if you're going to start a podcast, I would say be willing to be in it for six months to a year without, you know, real action happening for you because it takes that much time to become a better host, to get out there, to get known, to book the right guests. So I would say have the time into it. But also the biggest thing is working on your chops as a host. Because that is the number one thing that will do that will that will give you pay dirt. You know, I've looked at other people that interview well, Larry King, Oprah, people like that, and I look at what do they do? What do they do better? And I've noticed for a lot of people like that, the question that they ask isn't the question they're going to ask. The really good follow up question is actually what they're looking for. They're looking to open the conversation, and the follow up conversation is where the gold is. I also do something when I'm prepping as well. I won't listen to a whole interview somebody's done but I'll listen to a couple minutes of it and, and not actually for what they're going to talk about, but because I want to see them. 
How do they respond to questions? Do they respond short or do they respond long? Are they somebody that needs a longer question in order to actually do something? So you want to learn a little bit about their communication style and it's going to help you to conduct a better interview. And doing things like that is actually going to make your content um, you know, more interesting and, and, and you know, gather more earballs and eyeballs so that you can get more people on it. So to me, I would say, no, not everybody needs to have one. Work on yourself as a host and be willing to, to commit to this thing without you know, being a, a podcast millionaire in month three. You know? How's Bob doing? <laughs> Bob's doing great, man. By okay. the way, I think it should be earlobes and eyeballs. Is okay. It- I, I like earballs. Ear, ear balls. I like earballs too. <laughs> uh, don't get me wrong. I, I love a good earball. Um, <laughs> can I ask you a random ass question? Like most you, of yours are Bob Stewart. Right. You got a master specializing in in early Roman emperor worship cults, and I'm yes. fascinated. By that. <laughs> like, I would assume that having here. So here's my question: What can you tell me? Would would have been like some practice or leadership? Um, you know, skill demonstrated by these folks that led to these cults forming around them. That's not like bad, right? That's like something positive that, um, we could, that you learn from those people where they built these really big followings of people, you know, at this worship level, but like, what's something that we could learn out of that, that, you know, not nefarious in use, but that would help us build a, a following ourselves. Good question, okay. Bob Stewart. It's all somewhat nefarious, Bob. Um, <laughs> one, one, a, a big part of it is command of propaganda because um, because really, if you look at it, the the one that established divinity of emperors was was Caesar Augustus, who was the first emperor. Um, born Gaius Octavius, he was Julius Caesar's adopted son who became uh, Caesar Augustus. But the thing that he did is he observed this competition between his adopted father, Julius Caesar, and Pompey the Great. Um, and Pompey was this guy that he was in love with Alexander the Great, thought he was like the greatest guy in history and tried to emulate him. And so he, you know, Pompey conquered Europe, he conquered, he conquered Africa, he conquered Asia. And and those are three things that Alexander the Great did. So the thing that he learned out of that though, because August, uh, Julius Caesar had tried to very loosely tie himself to like gods, be like, yeah, I'm, I'm related to the goddess Venus. Yeah. She's like my, my aunt. So that's how he tried to do is by tying himself to divinity. And what they what he actually learned is sure you need some idea of like why you're important or that divine connection whatever it may be we call it celebrity now, right? But he found it's better to be loved than feared. And that was the big thing. People feared Caesar, people loved Pompey. And people would follow Pompey, they'd have parades for Pompey. They do all these different things for Pompey because he loved people. He took care of them. He shared his spoils. And he was just this very historic character. And the only reason he's dead is because Julius Caesar killed him because he felt like he was a threat to him. And when, when Augustus observed this, he said, okay, there's a few really smart political things that my, my, my father did here, but people follow you if they love you. And that is what Pompey did. It was better to be loved than feared. I love, I, that's, that's good. I mean, it's, you know, we treat people right. We, we um, we show empathy, we right? Like, oh, we're not talking about, you just said propaganda. Like, to me, even in our own worlds, like, there's a story being told about us, right? And if, and, yeah. like, if we're not out commanding or creating that story for people, they're going to fill it in one way or another. So even if I'm not Julius Caesar or... Donald Trump or whoever it is, right? I still, yeah. there's a story being told about me and the propaganda is really like me controlling the narrative of that story. And I think yeah, that's a brilliant a point. That. That's a brilliant point, Bob, because the, the, that actually is what PR is, right? That's actually what PR is. So Alexander the Great was the first person ever to have a scribe follow him around and write stories about him that he, he approved. And that actually, the, it was the scribe Arian. It was like his publicist that wrote all about him. And he wrote a book later called The Campaigns of Alexander. But the thing that you can learn from that is when you look at PR, PR is telling your story because it's going to get told by somebody else no matter what. So you need to fill that void with something, right? And I've talked to a lot of people that are like, you know, my business is doing really well. I'm just going to keep doing better and better and better until somebody notices me. That's not going to happen unless you got a sex tape, right? Like <laughs> it, it, it's for most times, unless you do something wrong, no one's going to notice there. Are, the, the news cycle is 24 hours. It's moving fast. You know, stories are out, out on Twitter within minutes. 
So you need to be consistently telling people about the good works you've done, how you're helping, what your business is doing, how you're helping others, because that that void will be filled by someone. You better fill it by yourself. Yeah. Uh, Folks, let's be very clear. I'm putting a little asterisk beside what was just said. And at the bottom, it says, we here at Win May Give do not promote making sex tapes, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want anyone to hear that and say, oh, that's how I get noticed. I go out and I, okay, that, it's not from our podcast that you heard that. Let's be very but you clear. Get, you get what I'm saying, Chad? Like if you Absolutely. do something like, you know, like everybody remembers Wesley Snipes cheated on his taxes, right? Because they talked about it forever. But nobody remembers how good Passenger 57 was. Oh, and the Blade Trinity, man. Those are good <laughs> movies. But like, you get what I'm saying? Like, People will talk about the negative things and it spreads so fast. So you have to tell your own story, man. You do. I, I, pr I preach that one all the time to people about making sure that you're telling the story because someone's going to tell it's it. It's going to get told. Their own way. Yes. Yelp's a, good example. Like, go, go, own way. Yelp's a good example of that, right? Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just the way I think there's a lot of people out there that like they don't leave the 10 good reviews at the 10 restaurants, but they're going to tell you all about that one that they didn't, you know, where they they got the cold food, right? And they want to go online yeah. and, and tell that story. Um, so in some ways, like we need people that know our story that like, I'll bring it back to real estate. Like we, we need to have advocates out there for us, right? They're saying, no, this guy's great, man. You gotta, you gotta go work with him. Um, I would assume a lot of these Roman emperor worship cults were built around them leveraging that next level of people around them to help share that story. Like you said, you know, Alexander the Great had his scribe around him, but. Um, it was propaganda though, too. Like, you know, that's why their faces were on coins. That's why, you know, the, they were statues of the emperor at temples. And if you look at it, I think uh, uh, to kind of put this in modern terms, a, a, a way that this is, we see this now is you're creating, when you create separation between people and people they can't reach, that starts to feel like divinity, right? Like I'm not saying the Kardashians are divine, right? But there are people out there worshiping people like that yeah. because there's this separation between them and there seem like they're people they can't connect with. And that actually is all it is, is they're creating an inability for others to connect with them and creating this kind of divine level. And we see it right now with celebrity. And I think it's so much more accessible too, because as a society, we lost our spirituality in a lot of ways. And that's getting filled with a need for celebrity and things and things like that. So we're, we're, we do the exact same things thousands of years later, man. It just takes different form. Yeah. All right, Jeremy. So how do we, how do I word this right? How do we not allow that gap to happen? How do I, how does win make it pick on us, right? How does yeah. the win make give podcast become Rogan's podcast? Right. But not be at this level where the audience is sitting there and saying, well, I don't even connect with these people anymore. How do you keep that connection while becoming the number one in the area that you're working? Well, it might not always be duplicatable and you might not be able to do it every time, but respond to every YouTube comment, respond to every tweet, respond to every you know email when you can and find ways to, to do things that don't scale, because that is what makes, you know, like I I remember my first 10 YouTube subscribers because they still talk to me because I spent a bunch of time talking to them. And that's what you, you need to take a look at is how, what can you do that scales where you can connect with these people? Because what happens is there starts to get this disconnect, right? And you pull away from your power base, right? The people that are going to promote you are the people that feel like they're connected to you. And once you lose that connection, that's what happens. Does, does that make sense? Or am I, yeah, I kind of uh, getting makes, a little esoteric on you? Perfect. Perfect. So we used to, in uh, what year did we launch Active Brain Chat? In 2006, we had a platform in real estate that was pre-Facebook. It was like the place that, that real estate industry in the United States went online to, to talk. Uh, it was called Active Rain. And we spent so much time pouring into that community, Jeremy, literally responding to every email, every comment, like, and not just saying stuff like, hey, thanks for the comment, right? It was man, Jen, thanks for stopping by and leaving a comment. I really loved what you said right there. It was like actually, like you said, unscalable, mm -hmm. but it created, Chad knows this, a raving group of people that to this day, 10 years later, even though it's probably been neglected for the last five or six years, they still show up there. They still kind of have their mm -hmm. community. They, there's still a connection, even though we've not done a great job. Over when the I first five met years. you was one of those advocates came running into my office one day and said, active rain, active rain, active rain. And, and that's how I actually met you. So what, what you're saying is I, I Bob, you got to be better at your Facebook response yeah. with all the people in our community. Yeah. Right? But guys, you're oh, not always going to be Bob. perfect at that either. Right? Like, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have a YouTube video that gets, you know, gets a quarter of a million views or a million views. You're not gonna be able to respond to thousands of people, but you know, you do the best you can to respond to the ones you can just don't start 
Like this is the big problem people have when they're trying to get their first media is the most attainable media to you is your local area because it's your small pond that you're in, which means, you know, doing press releases in your local newspaper, getting on local news, doing these different things because you're a local person. But what a lot of people do is they skip that and they're like, well, how do I get in Inc. 500 and Forbes and these different things? And it's like, well, you, you have to actually take this, use your power base. But a lot of people don't use their power base, but it's there. The um, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's such a great example, right? One of the, the probably the grandest examples we have. I don't know how, if you're a fan of Gary V, but that dude still to this day with with a couple million followers, like he doesn't get to every comment, but he's definitely in there still, you know, working his power base essentially, right? Um, I met him at an event in 2016 when I was just fr- I was freaking nobody. And I said, Gary, I want to have you in my podcast. He goes, good, let's do it right here. He did a 20 minute interview with me right there that uh, became a podcast episode. So it's like, yeah. you know, th- th- those are things that most people would not do. They'd be like, well, no, or talk to this person and I'll ignore you for two years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. Right. He's a, I don't know, for me, he's kind of a, an ultimate example of this concept at, at play, right? You yeah. can't get to everybody, especially now he's gotten so big and but he's still, man, if you go into his Instagram, the last post he made, I guarantee you he responded to 5, 10, 15, 20 people in that thread. And that's what it takes because, you know, if that's what you can do, that's fine, right? You're running a business, you know, these different things, but just don't disconnect totally. Yeah, I, Bob, I messaged Jesse Itzler after he finished the presentation at the event we were at. And by the end of the day, he had responded. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he got I mean, in there, you right? Know, like, you, you know, Ben's, you know, he's, he eventually get back to you. There's these people that... Like if a Gary V, a Jesse Itzler, a Ben Kinney can do it, we can do it because most of us don't have a tenth of the audience that those people have. But but we don't need to. Like if I just have my little power base in Bellingham, Washington, where I sell real estate, right? And you, you can you can do a lot in in that local area. Yeah. All right. So we went to create your own life podcast, folks. Check it out, right? That's where Jeremy's sharing all this stuff. We got some leadership tips. We got some resiliency tips. Uh, we got some Roman history uh, lessons today. My favorite, by the way, I'm kind of a, a history nerd that never. Uh, I'm a mythology it. guy. So I, I'm give me those gods you were talking about. That's what I studied. The, when it got real, that, that wasn't as interesting to me. <laughs> We've gone everywhere with Jeremy today. Jeremy, what's the one last message though? that if you had to leave a final parting thought with our audience, what would that message be that they'd walk away from this episode hearing, even if it's one you've already said? I would just say there's value in hard work, man. You know, you don't have to do it forever, but there's value in hard work because it builds character. It builds resiliency. Um, it bu- bu- it's, you don't lose the value of a dollar when you know the amount of work it takes. So, you know, do hard work. Um, you may lose the value that dollar takes when, you know, inflation happens, but, you know, <laughs> do hard work, man. Cause you're, you're, you're going to get a lot of, you know, understand a lot of value of things. I love it. Awesome. I love it. All right, folks, check out Jeremy's podcast. Uh, like we said, create your own life podcast, check out some of the messages, interviews he's got. Don't go anywhere with us. We only get better with age because, well, we can only get better. Yeah, there's uh, nowhere to go from here but up, Chad. Nowhere we, to we go. We can't from go up. any other direction as we pull it together. Folks, join us in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash win, make, give, where we always keep the conversation going. And I know I'll respond to you. We'll work on getting Bob in there to respond a little more often as well. Until our next episode, as always, do good. <laughs>